Hello, everyone. We're going to get started in just a minute. While we're waiting to get started, if you want to say hello in the chat box, let us know where you're joining us from. Again, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. We're saying hello in the chat box now. Hello, everyone who's joining. We're going to get started in just a minute. Right now, we're saying hello in the chat box. Let's see. Let's see, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, Michigan, Oregon, Indiana, Colorado, Oklahoma, New Jersey, Florida. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Okay. Seeing the count slow down, so I think we can go ahead and get started. We'll let others join us after that. So again, hello everyone. Um, welcome. All attendees are in listener only mode. The webinar is being recorded and a link to the recording and slides will be made available to you. Welcome again. My name is Leslie Gabay Swanston. I'm the Director of Programs and Systems Quality. Welcome to our webinar, Cultural Crossroads, exploring the important intersection of summer program training and design with the critical need to address race, equity, and inclusion. As we're going along, if you have questions for our panel, please put those into the Q&A box. We'll try to catch them if they're in the chat box, but it's easier for us to see and read those. Um, if you put them into the Q&A box. So before we get started, a little bit about NSLA. The National Summer Learning Association is the only national nonprofit exclusively focused on addressing the achievement and opportunity gaps by increasing access to summer learning opportunities. NSLA's goal is to increase nationwide the number of high quality summer learning programs. To achieve this goal, NSLA recognizes and disseminates what works, offers expertise and support for programs and communities, and advocates for summer learning as a solution for equity and excellence in education. NSLA's work is driven by the belief that all children and youth deserve high quality summer learning experiences that will help them succeed in college, career, and life. Core to our work is the recognition that high quality summer learning programs work and have been shown to improve reading and math skills, school attachment, motivation and relationships with adults and peers. So with that, I'm gonna turn things over to the team at Breakthrough Collaborative, Mary Michelle, Meredith Zaki, and Rachel Martinez. Good morning, good afternoon, depending on where you're joining us from. Today, I'm excited to be sharing this virtual space with two of my colleagues to represent Breakthrough Collaborative. My name is Rachel Martinez. I'm the Chief People and Program Officer at Breakthrough's National Office. I will be celebrating nine years with the Collaborative this year. I use she, her, her pronouns. And I'm excited to introduce you to my colleague, Marianne. Hey y'all, my name is Marion Michelle and I am the Executive Director for Breakthrough Birmingham. I've been in this role for the past two and a half years. I use she, her, her pronouns and I also represent our affiliate committee, which represents the 24 affiliates that we have um, across the country. I'm excited to be here and I'm excited to be um, introducing Meredith. Hi everyone, my name is Meredith Zaki. I use she, her, hers pronouns. Uh, I've been in my role for about four and a half years. I'm the Senior Director of Programs for Breakthroughs National Office. And before being in this role, I worked for our affiliates uh, in Breakthrough Philadelphia, as well as Breakthrough Manchester in uh, New Hampshire. So 
So before we get started, we wanted to acknowledge the moment that we are living in. We appreciate everyone making time and space for today's conversation. We know that these are complex issues and can often elicit strong emotions and reactions. We know that many of you come to today's webinar with your professional hats on, seeking to learn new ideas for your own programs. But we also know that we come first as humans and those two things are inextricably linked. At Breakthrough, we believe in making the implicit explicit. So before we share more about Breakthrough's journey, there are a couple of things that we want to name explicitly. Each of us sitting here as individual humans, as panelists, and as members of the Breakthrough community is on a journey. Those journeys are lifelong. This work is hard and there are no days off. We come to, to this work and to today's presentation with an incredible sense of humility. We do not have it all figured out and we've made mistakes, but this is our work. We are committed to it and we're committed to learning along the way. In this work, there are many factors that we are in control of, but we also acknowledge that we operate within systems that may oppress students of color and other marginalized communities. As we reflect on where we are in our journey at Breakthrough, we find ourselves navigating a particularly high stakes crossroads for our students and broader community. It's not a crossroads that is new, but one where the stakes feel higher than ever. And we know that we must navigate it with care. Today, we're gonna to share four strategies or approaches, we're calling them the four C's that we're using to navigate through these crossroads. We'll share how a culture of collaboration has been foundational and necessary to advance this work as an organization, how we've committed and recommitted to this work. Marian will then share examples and insights about the importance of community context, and Meredith will share ideas and resources for supporting and developing culturally responsive teachers and leaders in preparation for this summer and beyond. We invite you to use the chat throughout this discussion um, to share your own ideas and reflections with one another. As we move through the presentation, you'll also see that we've included a few prompts on some of the slides. We also invite you and encourage you to submit questions in the Q&A section so that we can learn from each other at the end of the hour. So let's share a little bit more about who we are. Breakthrough creates empowering educational experiences for traditionally underrepresented students on their paths to college. We are the largest pre-professional teacher training program in the country. We address opportunity gaps for students starting in the critical middle school years and introduce college students to careers in teaching as we seek to build a diverse and talented educator workforce. Breakthrough Collaborative is a network of 24 affiliates. And while we're evolving our diversity, equity, and inclusion, we're not a new organization. We've been serving students and training teaching fellows for over 40 years. Our students come to Breakthrough as middle schoolers and typically participate for six years through high school graduation. Our students attend each summer's six week long program and students receive instruction on the next year's core academic courses and electives of their choice typically with a ratio of one teaching fellow to nine students. During the school year, Breakthrough students participate in after school and weekend enrichment programming. And once in high school, they participate in our college bound program, which focuses on high school success skills and college access. Ultimately, our goal is to prepare students for post-secondary success and beyond. Breakthrough students are taught and mentored by undergraduates who we call teaching fellows. Teaching fellows are recruited from over 250 colleges and universities across the country. We seek teaching fellow candidates with a demonstrated passion for working with our students and those with a deep interest in social justice. During the summer teaching fellow residency, our fellows participate in two weeks of training before entering the classroom with our students. They receive mentorship, feedback, professional development and assessments throughout the summer by program staff and experienced certified K-12 teachers who we call instructional coaches. As a result of this program, our teaching fellows gain a better understanding of the demands of teaching and are more interested in careers in education. Across our network, Breakthrough students are about 50% more likely to directly enroll in a four-year college or university than high school graduates nationwide, regardless of socioeconomic status. Once they get there, they are six times more likely to graduate from college than the national average for students from low-income families, and they graduate at the same rate as their most affluent peers. 
we also make an impact on our teaching fellows. 76% of our fellows enter careers in education as teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, counselors, and more. Nationally, there's been a substantial college enrollment drop-off documented this year at nearly 30% for students from lower income communities. That's versus 17% drop for students from higher income high schools. But we've learned that breakthrough students are still enrolling at higher rates than students from high income community schools. This is a testament not only to the strength of our students, but to breakthrough community that's weathered COVID together. So we wanna share a short video with you to see breakthrough in action. kids getting into learning and older kids getting into teaching. That combination of young kids who are discovering their academic potential and older kids discovering that they can make a difference in the world, it's magic. We're preparing low-income, first-generation students for success in college. Our students are coming to Breakthrough every summer, in the school year, after school, receiving lots of great support, all at no cost to them and their families. I've been in Breakthrough since I was going into fifth grade. I think Breakthrough has given me confidence more than anything. I love Breakthrough because the teaching fellows are so fun to hang around and they teach us well. What Breakthrough does is gives people an opportunity who are interested in education to try it out first. And if you love it, it gives you that level of experience that you need so you can come in and be confident in the classroom. When I was thinking about careers that I want to pursue in the future, education was one of them. And I think Breakthrough has generally solidified my interest in education. Being at Breakthrough and having programs like Breakthrough makes a huge difference for a teacher. And that in turn makes an even bigger difference for our students. So we hope you gave, uh, that gave you a little bit of a taste um, of breakthrough in that you saw some of the video from last summer's virtual programs. So last summer, like many of you and many organizations and schools across the country, our model was tested as never before when the COVID-19 pandemic catalyzed our pivot to take our traditionally in-person summer experience and put it all online. In the matter of a few short weeks, our affiliate staff came together with our national office team to redesign programming that ultimately served over 4,500 students and trained more than 700 teaching fellows. Now on the slide, you see a prompt that I mentioned earlier. So I invite you to share some of the ways that your organization pivoted last summer and how you plan to do it perhaps similarly or different to this summer. We were able to capture our research and learnings from that experience and produced two white papers. Our first paper, Breaking Through the Distance, identified successful strategies that were used to translate our traditionally in-person program to a completely online virtual program. Our second paper, Inspiring Students and Developing Teachers, unpacks the methods we use to train undergraduate students to be effective mentors and teachers for our students. Through our research, we've found that the breakthrough model is as effective online as it is on in person. We invite you to visit our website after today's webinar to learn more about the pivot. And I believe the links are also being shared in the chat. So let's dig in to our first strategy, our first C. For Breakthrough, this strategy has been foundational to our equity work. And to successfully advance this work, we've learned that we have to get foundational. Collaboration is a part of our name. And over the last four to five years, we've been especially intentional about fostering a culture that allows us to live up to that name. We've done that by restructuring our governance model to be more inclusive, ensuring that the affiliate and ultimately student and teacher voice informs and guides our work as a collaborative. 
We've accomplished this by creating an affiliate committee. Marion is a part of that committee um, and speaks regularly with our national team. It helps to foster relationships between our programs and provides greater affiliate representation and voting power on our national board. Breakthrough has a rich tradition of work groups. For decades, it's allowed us to develop new resources, learn, and elevate best practices across all levels of the organization. In 2017, we established a national DEI work group composed of affiliate program staff and executive directors, along with members of our national team. This group was involved in the development of our current strategic plan and ensured that we had a consistent lens of equity as we developed and codified our commitment to, to our DEI work internally. As we responded to COVID and the injustices of 2020, we continued to leverage the strength of collaboration as we came together to evolve resources in real time. We've learned that this process works best when we learn and grow from each other, both at the grassroots affiliate level and from the national lens. As we think about our second C, committing to the work, I think it's really important to point out that committing to the work isn't just about external communications. And that's not to say that external commitments aren't important, they absolutely are. But in order to do the work, to be able to realize the commitments we made outside of the organization, we had to show up first for ourselves and for our teams. We had to develop a common language and a shared understanding of what the work actually was and is. The DEI statement that you see on the screen now was another one of those foundational steps for us. It was created by our DEI work group a couple of years ago. It's guiding our work, but we know that words, uh, that we need to go beyond words. So then on the next slide, we'll share how we're realizing these words through action. To highlight a few examples of the work that is happening across this organization, this past summer, we made a public recommitment to the work and outlined six next steps. A couple of those include engaging a DEI consultant who's led us through an internal equity audit, and we are also participating in a DEI accelerator with other organizations. Our National Board of Trustees is also actively engaging in this work and recently passed a race and equity board resolution. We'd love to have you share in the chat what some of your own steps are that your organization has taken. Now let's focus on our third strategy, creating community context. At Breakthrough, community context is incredibly important because that's where our programs live, right? Our programs feed off of the dynamic ebb and flow between and across the affiliates in the national office. Each affiliate operates in a state and local community context and with the collaborative. So with the collaborative, we're operating at a more national community context. Our affiliates represent a blend of models. So we have our hosted sites, we have independent 501c3s, and we also have just alternatively structured models. Over the last few years, we've been incredibly proud of how our host schools have stepped up to tackle issues of racial injustice and systemic oppression, particularly in response to the events of last summer. And we've also seen that our independent 501c3 affiliates have served as leaders in their specific communities and learning to navigate responses to incidents of hatred and violence. That said, since about half of our affiliates are still hosted, the return of our students to our independent schools, so our private schools, have raised some significant questions about equity, especially given that so many of our students have haven't yet experienced in-person in learning this, this year, or they've experienced very little of it since the pandemic began. While we feel a strong obligation to provide the same services to breakthrough students that their more affluent peers receive, we don't necessarily have access to the same resources and systems to support that to make this a reality. So in some cases, our students are coming from as far as 100 or as many as 100 different schools to attend breakthrough. And so there's a, a lot of different contexts coming through. This particular context has met an ever evolving set of planning questions and logistical concerns as we pr prepare for the next breakthrough summer, which is quickly approaching, where affiliates are making decisions about whether they're going to be virtual or in person or hybrid for their particular community's needs. In addition to the communities our students are operating and living in, we also exist in the context of the communities of our fellows and our staff. We've worked really hard to diversify our teaching fellow teams and create more mirrors for students in our communities, and we've been pretty successful. Since over three fourths of our teaching fellows identify as BIPOC and nearly half of them di uh, demonstrate financial need, we know that our fellows not only need training as teaching fellows, but they also need training to support, I'm sorry, they also need support to, uh, to navigate the current moment that we are all going through right now. 
While some teaching fellows are local to the area where they teach that summer, many come from across the country to teach in the, the particular areas that they're in. And with that in mind, our affiliates have worked to provide opportunities for fellows to understand and contextualize their local community, particularly in regards to questions of educational equity. So I'm excited to tell you a little bit more about Breakthrough Birmingham and how we approached that last year. When we train, for, uh, train our fellows during orientation, we look at the resources we have at our, dis at our disposal to make the biggest impact. Especially in Birmingham, the best resource we have to make fellows fall in love with our city and with the task at hand are its people. And one such person is Dr. Naisha Black, who's a pretty well-known sociologist and data analyst here in Birmingham, who does a phenomenal job of making really complicated topics understandable to everyone. The way that we sort of set this up was to make sure that prior to the start of orientation, fellows began thinking about some of these complicated topics in their pre-work. Particularly for Dr. Black's session, we, um, we asked them to reflect on a 30 minute snippet of slavery by another name on PBS based on a book of the same name written by Douglas Blackman, which argues that slavery didn't end, I'm sorry, didn't end with civil war. And it in fact persisted into the 20th century, especially in regards to convict, leaving, convict leasing, peonage and sharecropping, which helped uh, build the Birmingham railroads and wealth. So the goal of the time with Dr. Black was to understand the Birmingham community and her piece was just to make sure to start off with a poverty simulation and then lead into a two-way conversation that contextualized inequality and inequity both nationally and at home in our city. She started off with the history of redlining, of capital and black labor that built Birmingham, of suburbanization and the impact of highways on the particular communities. She then went into the implications for what it means for today, the unequal school systems that we have, the food deserts that where our kids are, are a part of, the high unemployment rate and the blight. And finally, she focused on the people and how the power of change should rest firmly in the hands of Birminghamians who are resilient as history has told us time and time again, and who are constantly ensuring that they build a better future for their children and within their communities especially with the context of last summer with the protests surrounding the deaths of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we wanted to provide a foundation for fellows to reflect on their personal journeys, be intentional with our scholars and be more comfortable with having to have sometimes difficult conversations. That led into our school year program. So our school year fellowships were inspired by summer 2020, where we saw the need to continue to support not only our scholars, but our teaching fellows. We'd been playing around with what our fellowship model could look like for school year. And by the spring, we were more strategic about what ongoing training for fellows could look like because most of them were returners and we wanted to give them the opportunity to continue growing. We focused on having our, our fellows think a little bit more about our identities based on the summer feedback that we received where many of them identified that they wanted more support in exploring their identities within the work that they were doing. So our theme for this spring was what does it mean to be an educational advocate and leader? And we brought in six different speakers from various local organizations and universities for uh, over the uh, course of about 10 weeks. For an hour a week, we had professional development sessions where speakers spent about 45 minutes going over a variety of topics, focusing on reimagining education in the US to how teachers in the classroom could impact their students. Topics like wraparound services, the, the debate around charters and how teachers could advocate for their communities even while being in the classroom allowed fellows to reflect on how to intentionally take next steps with, within or outside of the world of education. We wanted our fellows to become culturally responsive educators and leaders in their communities so that if we don't get to see them next year, if we don't get to see them the next semester, we wanna know that they've got a lot in their toolbox to keep tweaking their future decisions. So now we'll explore our final strategy, uh, which is developing culturally responsive teachers and leaders. So as a grassroots organization, our affiliates are always driving our work forward at the local and community level with new innovations and initiatives, often inspired by the teaching fellows, our students and our staff, as Marianne just described in Birmingham. And while the grassroots nature of our work is core to who we are, we also recognize that we need to align ourselves toward common goals or standards to ensure a high quality and consistent experience for our various constituents. With that in mind, and as part of our strategic plan, we developed collaborative wide standards across four areas of the organization, including standards for students and for teaching fellows. These standards were created by work groups, including affiliate staff, former teaching fellows, instructional coaches and students, as well as national office staff. 
two standards that we developed for teachers focused specifically on purposeful high quality orientation and training, specifically in the area of diversity, equity, and inclusion, and community and local context, and supporting teachers in working to create and maintain culturally responsive and inclusive classrooms. So in the chat, would love to hear from you all. What has your organization added to or expanded in your summer training plans to help advance your staff or teachers in terms of diversity, equity, and inclusion? So now that we have these standards in place, our next step was to create an inclusive work group to generate resources to support affiliates in meeting those standards. To be clear, our affiliates have been training their teaching fellows in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion for a long time. Um, and many engage external consultants or speakers to enrich these trainings, like we heard about with Dr. Naisha Black. That being said, we knew we needed to build a stronger universal understanding and jumping off point, something that we have already done with our core breakthrough instructional trainings for teaching fellows, as well as our national curriculum. The work group on race, equity, diversity, and inclusion, which we shortened to READY, was extended as a compensated opportunity to our teaching fellow and instructional coach alumni, as well as our affiliate staff. And the people listed above were ultimately selected from many applicants. We chose to have equal representation across three constituent groups, teaching fellows, instructional coaches, and affiliate staff, knowing the critical importance of involving the communities most directly impacted by the work, as well as those training and working with those communities. As you can see, the work group included people from coast to coast and across the country, in addition to folks who've had a variety of different roles at Breakthrough. So it was a really rich group for discussion and resource creation. I served as the facilitator for the group to schedule meetings and provide overall guidance, but all of our products that we created were a collaborative effort. The Ready Group was tasked with creating resources for training teaching fellows during their initial orientation and beyond. And after much discussion and brainstorming around what topics to cover, the group landed on a set of core concepts. Self-reflection and personal and racial identity development, dismantling structural racism and promoting educational equity, developing strong relationships with students and colleagues, applying ready or culturally responsive teaching in practice and beyond breakthrough. So thinking about continuous learning and activism. We also recognized from the beginning of this process that these concepts and issues are not unique to or relegated to one specific area of training. They are truly interwoven throughout everything we do at Breakthrough. And in that vein, we created visual icons to connect these concepts throughout our Breakthrough instructional trainings as points of reference. In this way, teaching fellows not only learn about lesson planning and classroom culture and management, but also have the chance to explore where these concepts intersect with those components of teaching. Each of our Breakthrough Instructional Trainings now also concludes with a set of reflection prompts that tie the ready core concepts to that particular teacher skill, encouraging further reflection and learning as our teaching fellows develop as culturally responsive teachers and leaders. Here are some examples of these reflection prompts indicated with their matching icon. I'll read one of them and then I'll give you a minute to look at the others. So in our classroom routines workshop, thinking about it from a self-reflection standpoint, what examples of classroom routines helped you learn as a student? Which routines made you feel valued, respected, and dignified as a person? And we'll be sharing these slides after so you can spend some more time looking them, at them if you like. These prompts aren't meant to have easy answers. They're really designed for teaching fellows to come back to and reflect on throughout the summer and beyond their experience at Breakthrough. Working collaboratively over the course of the last few months, the Ready Group worked to identify specific resources and workshops to prepare and train teaching fellows. We had an initial sense of what we hoped to create, but our products evolved as we worked together and collaborated, ultimately creating the list of items we have outlined here. We made a user-friendly website for affiliates to access these resources, including a user guide to orient folks to the materials, norms that are specific to Breakthrough, but also to the Ready Conversations, 
a glossary so that we could have agreed upon definitions for what can be really complex and nuanced terms. Uh, and then we created four workshops or modules. So one in each area of those core concepts we mentioned in the order that we listed here on this slide. We also developed a community response protocol for creating and maintaining a safe and inclusive culturally responsive community. So there are proactive things like creating a community calendar to be aware of events that might be celebrated by or important to your constituents and reactive things like what steps to take to respond to incidents of injustice in your community. We provided some guidance for creating and maintaining affinity and accountability groups. And we added a resource library with more in-depth resources and information tied to each topic. As a group, we developed a structure for each workshop or module. In reflecting after the process, we found that it really closely mimicked the breakthrough lesson planning structure, which aligns nicely with our overall training and instructional model. Each module is designed to be relatively brief, 30 to 45 minutes, with some a bit longer, closer to an hour, and they contain pre-work and terminology to review in advance. After that, teaching fellows are asked to check in with themselves and journal privately on how they're responding to these concepts. All modules come with an activating warning, recognizing that this content can elicit a strong emotional response from teaching fellows and the staff that are leading them for a number of reasons. We also start off each module with those norms. We provide reflective questions, a clear objective and purpose, and then an icebreaker focused on the topic at hand. After that, there's a brief processing opportunity for teaching fellows to understand the theory, followed by a specific application of the idea or concept of breakthrough. Teaching fellows then have a chance to share and check in as a group briefly, and then the sessions close out with a chance to reinforce the concept. We also provide a list of resources as a deeper dive or an opportunity for teaching fellows to continue to explore these concepts. This is also an option for differentiation, since many of our teaching fellows are returners, whether that's from being a teaching fellow in a previous summer or being a breakthrough student themselves, and they may approach things from a variety of viewpoints and or starting places. We don't expect to cover everything about these complex topics in these brief workshops. What we want to do is really share foundational understandings and begin to explore the intersections of these concepts with teaching fellows and their roles at Breakthrough and Beyond. As we said at the beginning of the webinar, we know this work is never done and we look forward to getting feedback from our teaching fellows, instructional coaches and affiliate staff to inform future iterations of these resources and the continuation of this work. Our website also includes, our Ready website also includes options to share additional resources and information, which can be done anonymously if folks want to. And going forward, our goal is to iterate these trainings and evolve them for other constituents like our instructional coaches, those professional teachers who work with our teaching fellows to support their growth, our professional staff, whether that's affiliate staff and national staff, and additional constituents as we see the need arising. And as we know, the work continues in all directions at once. So these updates will take place in alignment with other moving pieces like our work with the Promise 54 DEI Accelerator, building out our professional development and socio-emotional support framework for teaching fellows and students, and our larger diversity, equity, and inclusion collaborative-wide strategy. So thank you for joining us for today's webinar and for your thoughtful engagement with these concepts. Uh, we wish you the very best of luck in advancing your programmatic work this summer. Together, we are making a difference in the lives of students and working to ensure a better future for all of us. Great, thank you so much, Meredith, uh, Marion, and Rachel. So now we have some time for some questions for our audience. If you have a question for any of the panelists, uh, please put that into the Q&A box. So we have a couple in here already. I'll go ahead and read. Um, Katrina wanted to know, would you be able to share the community response protocol or snapshot of one section um, to get a better idea of the resource. It seems like a great idea and a tangible resource. 
Yeah, so I can give a brief overview. Um, and in general, if you're interested in learning more about these resources, we'd love to connect. Um, we're definitely happy to collaborate with others who are working to do um, this type of work at their organizations. Um, in general, I think, like I said, there's sort of a proactive component to it. So thinking about how your building is laid out, how your what's artwork look like on your walls? Are you creating an inclusive and welcoming space for your communities? Are they accessible for all of your communities? Um, that calendar, like we said, and then we go into kind of thinking more from both the communication side of responding to incidents and justice, what needs to be communicated or trumpeted out to your communities, but also how do you respond to those? How do you support, create support structures? How long does that go on? What does that situation look like? So it's a little open-ended, I think, in that degree to allow folks to really specialize their responses to specific incidents, but um, that's kind of the broad brush overview. Okay, thank you. Um, can you see any examples of the training content or can you describe what the training content looks like and can it be adapted to train mentors within educational programs? Yeah, that's a great question. So I think in terms of content, um, it's really kind of what we just walked through in terms of what the different sections are. We did find it was really helpful. There's so many resources out there um, that we really pulled from. So we had some that were recommended by our consultant dynasty. So racial equity tools is a website we used a fair amount. Um, we had some sort of surprising ones. Colorado School of Mines has a ton of resources and different things to explore. Um, so it may be things that don't necessarily seem like they're applicable to your work, but they're actually great resources. Um, so we really pulled from a variety of different places. I think what was most helpful to us was really trying to drill down what discrete and concrete skills we wanted our teaching fellows to tackle or walk away from these workshops with. And that was where kind of the, the rubber hit the road when it came to creating the actual resources. So I think that process was really important to us in terms of actually creating the resources themselves. So the content is really designed to be open-ended in the same way as our breakthrough instructional trainings are. So we assume that if I hand them off to Marion, Marion's going to take them and look at them and reflect on how that fits with her particular program model, what she's running this summer, her communities, and she's going to take the opportunity to really make them her own so that they feel authentic to her experience and her affiliate. Thank you. Um, so you shared some of the locations that breakthrough is in. Um, Somebody had a question about the Chicago interest. Is there any interest in possibly expanding there? Or how could they possibly get a, a breakthrough affiliate in their area? That's a great question. A question that we get um, a lot. We would encourage you to reach out. Um, we are always happy to have those conversations and to share more information about what that looks like. Right. Um, given how much content there is to cover within DEI, um, have you used or do you have a plan for ongoing support or revisiting some of the module content that the fellows get prior, get prior to launching into the work as they go about the teaching experience? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, we knew how critical and important it was to have something for us to jump off from in this summer, but we also recognized that we were going to have a limited period of time. So we worked as a group together um, and met sort of every week or every other week for a few months. And we were, we kind of defined like, this is what we can cover. This is as much as we can get to for this particular summer, knowing that it will need to be a built, a built out resource. So ideally we'd have um, we also know that we have more time with our teaching fellows to have these deep conversations and to dig into things during the orientation period because there are no students at the program yet during that orientation time. So ideally, I think we would have kind of revisiting modules, but they would probably be relatively short so they could be done as kind of professional developments or explorations that are going on throughout the course of the summer. Okay. Um, how do you address parent concerns around topics of diversity, race, and social justice? I can speak a little to that. So I think um, I'll speak specifically for Breakthrough Birmingham, but I suspect that this is the same across the board. When we talk about community at Breakthrough, it's not just talking about um, the community context that I mentioned earlier. It's not just talking about scholars alone or teaching fellows alone. It also includes families. And so I know at Breakthrough Birmingham, our families know what's taking place at all times and there is an open door policy. There are some thresholds that we wanna make sure that our families understand that uh, 
that our students sort of need to meet or at least be familiar with. And some of these more difficult top conversations fall into that um, fall into that realm. And it's more about making sure that students are aware, right, that they've been exposed and what they choose to do with that information is up to them, just like anybody else. But we want our families to always know that a breakthrough is a place of learning. Thank you. Um, so another question here, do you focus on traditional classroom education or do you include non-formal as well? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so I'll answer kind of looking from the broader perspective. I think it's a blend. Um, we definitely, in, a, in sort of our pre-2020 model, we definitely had sort of classroom structures where students would receive kind of, they get a chance to get a sneak peek at the content that comes up for their following year, um, as well as explore topics that might be interesting to them. Uh, folks have really played around, I think, in the last year and, and thinking into this year with things like a project-based learning approach, um, maybe doing interdisciplinary curriculum, um, just knowing that so much of the content and the research that came out from the switch uh, of in-person to virtual was that the, the that screen fatigue is still real and that it's really important to maximize the time that you have with students. And so we have seen some shifts, I think, in some structures in terms of what the critical focuses are and how folks get at that core content. Um, so I would say it's really a range, um, but there is a blend, I think, of sort of traditional instruction as well as as exploratory learning. What are the specific lessons being taught to the students? Yeah, great question. So again, I can answer sort of from the broader view and then I don't know if Marion, you wanna add anything from your last summer. Um, so it really, it kind of runs the gamut. I think our, our traditional curriculum includes literature, math, uh, science and uh, writing. And so there's sort of all of the things that are composed in that. Our core grades are rising seventh to rising ninth. So we try to align with uh, common core standards or next generation science standards. Um, some of our affiliates also serve younger grades or slightly older grades, particularly in high school, we do a lot of work around being prepared for college and college access and college readiness. Um, but it kind of depends a little bit on the different sites and specifically if there are, we do a lot of work and I think specifically last summer saw a lot of sites really wanted to connect content to current events, what was going on, how can it seem meaningful for students, how can they engage, not just in the academics, but really the core of what they're learning being connected to who they are and where they live. Yeah, I think that that was a pretty good overview, Meredith. I think uh, so I can speak specifically for Birmingham site. Um, last summer, we actually only had two um, of the four contents really focused on in terms of the academic pieces. We combined reading and writing into one class, our humanities class, and it was very much social justice oriented to keep into account like everything taking place in the world um, and focus a lot on their community, on food deserts, et cetera, et cetera. Like, what can we do? What, what are actionable steps once we know about this information? And then our second um, core class was our STEM class. So majority of it focused on the science and math components of it, um, but playing around with what is like project-based learning look like in this particular area. Um, and I think, I know, I don't think the question was about the academics. I'm not sure if the question was only about academics, but just to step back, we also focus on with our advisory curriculum, um, making sure that students are building on their, you know, social emotional skills, community building, just, you know, the softer pieces of what does it mean to be the best possible, your best version of yourself, um, so that our students understand that breakthrough is not just about the academic components of, of like, that's where growth lies, but actually as a person we wanna grow. And so what does it mean to grow? And so we focus a little bit on that as well. Um, and the last two pieces. So uh, last summer we had a, um, what we called exploratory. So it was it was a digital, <laughs> it was a digital exploration class. And the, the idea of it was we knew a lot of our students uh, while they are digital natives are not necessarily digital experts. And so while they can scroll through Instagram and create TikToks, that doesn't necessarily mean that they know how to research on a computer as quickly or as, as agilely as we would have liked. And so we wanted to sort of build that skill, really go through what it means to actually um, explore the World Wide Web that's at your fingertips, but on a computer screen and not necessarily on a phone. So we figured that that would be a great skill for them to bring into the classroom um, for a virtual classroom that we were expecting. 
And the last piece is just, uh, we had a couple of electives taking place last summer and, and that's all teacher teaching fellow created on our end. And what it looked like for us as staff was just to make sure that it aligned with the basics of what it is we knew was great teaching, but was focused, the content was primarily focused on this intersection of where student interest and teaching fellow interest met. Thanks. Um, how do you collect data or assess students in a way that is anti-bias or racist? I know that funders often want quantitative or qualitative. Do you have any specific assessment tools you use? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, that could be a whole nother webinar conversation. Um, but we, uh, up until the uh, summer of 2019, we used uh, Renaissance star assessments. So we used them in math and reading. Um, we transitioned. Uh, so in 2020, as with many folks, we ultimately decided not to assess our students in the summer of 2020 through uh, an organized formal assessment. A lot of folks used other opportunities or, or local forms, formative assessments and other things like that at their sites. Um, and then we did some research and really thought about kind of where we wanted to go from there and had an opportunity with an organization called Edmentum. Um, and they have an assessment called Exact Path, which also you can test students in math and literature. You can also do a writing assessment if you want. It also had the opportunity to assess more grades than we had been able to with RENSTAR and have longer access and consistent access to our data. So that's the assessment that we are exploring and moving forward with this summer. But that being said, so much of our work really relies on a combination of that quantitative component and then our, our qualitative exploration. So surveys, uh, all of the interviews that we did for our white papers, um, you know, we do students, student surveys, family surveys, teaching fellow surveys, instructional code surveys, staff surveys. If, if there's a constituent, we have survey data from them. So there's definitely a ton of different ways that we can sort of splice and review. Um, we also have a director of research and evaluation who spent sort of the last couple of months working with us to review our data definitions and really look at the way we collect data and the way we report data on students. So we've done some significant work looking at our data through this kind of DEI lens in the last year as well. Uh, would you say that the social justice concerns serve as the foundation from which you pull to facilitate learning? Can you repeat the question one more time, please? I guess, so, I guess the question is, is, uh, is social justice central to how you facilitate learning? Right. I'm not going to speak for the collaborative, but I will say yes, at the most basic level. Um, think great teaching makes sure makes sure that we involve our students at the most at the core. I think breakthrough does exactly that. And one of the most beautiful things about being part of the collaborative is every single affiliate sort of does it differently based on what the needs of the community are, which is sort of the start of the social justice piece. And then making sure that students are focused on the advocacy, the work, and just making sure that the choices that they're making for their tomorrow, whether that means for them individually or is them in their family, them in their community, them in the world, really is, is focused on this really in reflective and intentional mindset that we sort of cultivate here at Breakthrough. Um, if you have any other questions for the panel, please put those into the Q&A box. Um, somebody wanted to have some uh, advice on how to summer educators build supportive relationships with students for a short time. So short weekly visits over maybe six weeks. So not a lot of time with students. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, I think there's a lot of different ways that it happens. Um, I will say that the, the advisory component that Marion was speaking about is definitely something that's central to all of our affiliates. Um, and so that's an opportunity for, um, in addition to being a teacher, each of our uh, teaching fellows has a small group of students that they work with and they advise or mentor those students. Um, and usually they're kind of responsible for them every day. They check in with them in the morning, they see how they're doing, they check in with them at the end of the day sometimes. Um, but really it's kind of, it's a, it's a dual layered relationship where sometimes they're teaching those students, sometimes they're not, um, but they're really getting a chance to build those relationships. I think the other thing that really is unique to our program is just that our teaching fellows are near peers. They're not so far removed from where our students have are in their lives. And so I think there is sort of a natural 
um, opportunity to build connections. That and the fact that so many of our teaching fellows choose to return and Breakthrough is a really sticky program as I like to call it. So there's a lot of faces that come back that you see who may have worn different hats over the years. And I think that really creates this long-standing culture that lives and breathes on its own in some ways outside of just the people that are there. Um, so we have a, a question from Susan. She says, we worked last year with the university undergraduate students as service learning teachers to, class, to a class of middle school students. Um, we're launching our second summer of this and wonder what you wonder what you might suggest you be sure to include. So any mess has for getting those, those undergraduates. I think in terms of just, uh, I guess I'm, I'm trying to see if the question is about the characteristics of the of the undergraduate student or the program itself. So I'll answer a little bit of both. I think um, with our teaching fellows, the big piece is uh, a love of the work that we're that they're about to jump into. Um, just a really deep appreciation for that piece and the willingness to grow. So just that coachability piece. And then for the program, the the one big aspect that our kids are always talking to us about what really stands out is just the amount of fun our um our kids have in the program and so just making sure to really stress that that even when it's a learning a summer learning program learning doesn't have to be this road sort of boring thing it, it doesn't have to also it doesn't doesn't have to have all the bells and whistles either right it just needs to be really focused on relationships and so if y'all are creating a program like that making sure to really intentionally provide the opportunities for relationships to be built, um, for them to be fostered in order for the outcomes that you're looking for to be um, to be apparent. Um, can you say a little bit about the all school meetings? Sure, so I can answer kind of from a broader perspective and then Mary, you can speak to, to Birmingham. So all school meetings are typically, uh, sometimes they happen at some sites every day, sometimes they happen once a week, um, but they usually have sort of core components. So sometimes they'll have a word of the day that folks are focusing on. They might have a vision statement. So a teaching fellow might step up and kind of tell a story about an important growth moment in their lives. Um, sometimes there are skits that our teaching fellows do um, that are around the word of the day. Um, sometimes there's kind of perfunctory items, so things that kids need to know, announcements, if there's specific things coming up in the community, we'll include those there. Um, but there's also just usually some sort of like silly, funny, very joyful component to them as well. Um, and then I know at some sites, so in Manchester, it was more of a, a student talent show and performance opportunity as well. So kids got to showcase different talents and um, in groups, it was really an opportunity and a chance for every student to get to stand on stage and present whether that was in a group or by themselves. And at Birmingham, so when we were doing it in person, a lot of it was focused on team building. So particularly in their advisory groups and their families, um, really the competitions against each other, whether it was you know for some sort of Jeopardy game or a basketball game or whatever it was, just a small amount of time on a daily basis in the, in the afternoons before they got on their buses to go home to just really connect with everybody. Um, in the virtual world last summer, what it meant for us was once a week, we all sort of get together. Some of it is like the just administrative stuff, but a lot of it was because it, the virtual world is so odd where you don't get to see anybody except for whoever is in your little box. It was an opportunity for teach, for students to be able to connect with teaching fellows that were not necessarily their advisors or their teachers. It was an opportunity to connect with people who were in different advisories um, because there's not a hallway to sort of pass by and sort of see other people. So uh, we used a lot of time to just do a lot of games and community building. Um, and this summer going forward, that that's what we were thinking about doing too, just making sure that it's an opportunity for people to connect with one another and to build relationships, or at the very least, especially in the virtual world, to know that there are other people that are doing the same thing that you're doing and having just as much fun. Great, thank you. I think we have time for just two more questions. Um, this one says, our organization does literature enrichment activities using teaching artists. Are there literature texts with a DEI focus you would recommend? Yeah, definitely. So um, I'm not sure if we, uh, if someone can pull it up quickly enough, but I know we had a, a summer book bingo from last year 
Um, and so I kind of pulled that together and it was really just a combination of a fair amount of our sites do sort of one book, one community. So they'll read the same book across the community. Um, sometimes students get to put up a couple of different options and then they choose that. Um, so that's definitely something that's great. Um, it also includes some of the books from our national literature curriculum. Um, so we have the other West Moore as a, I think like eighth grade text. And then we have Claudette Colvin, Twice Towards Justice, which is definitely one I recommend. Um, and, but yeah, there's there's a ton of them on that book bingo that, that I think come up and change and they evolve really every year as we get to know more and more about our communities and what is interesting and meaningful to students. Um, so there's definitely a lot on there. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, and it looks like it's in the chat box now, link to that. Um, let's see, take one last question. I guess this is just more in general curriculum. I'm still looking, they're looking at curriculum standards lessons for K-4. If anyone has suggestions where to find easy ones to incorporate into an OSD program, she'd appreciate it. So what places look for a curriculum? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm not sure off the top of my head. I do know that there's been, I mean, I think I have some follow-up questions, like, is it happening virtually? Is it happening hybrid? Is it happening in person? Um, because I think there's different resources being prepared for all of those. Certainly the standards may be the same. Um, I, I think common, I don't know off the top of my head how far Common Core goes. I know we have our youngest um, grades that we serve as rising fifth, um, but that might be a starting place as well, I would think. Um, and then from there, there's just been a ton of folks putting out curriculum. If you're looking for social justice curriculum, I know um, they used to be called Teaching Tolerance and now they're called a new name. <laughs> it's on the top <laughs> of my tongue. Um, but yeah, they have a, they have a new name. Um, and so they, they have a lot of great resources as well. It's called Learning for Justice. There we go. And I, as I used to be a history teacher and, and social justice was one of our pieces and uh, teaching tolerance slash learning for justice was a phenomenal resource for just a starting point to have standards for uh, social justice work. Okay, so I think that's all the questions we have. Um, I want to say thank you to Mary and Meredith and Rachel for a great presentation. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and wrap up with just a couple of announcements. This webinar is part of our Voices of Summer webinar series. Um, if you'd like to see more about of the past webinars, there are links to the recordings on our website, summerlearning.org forward slash webinars. And we have a, a lot of great webinars coming up. Next week is going to be a webinar titled Creating Healing-Centered Summer Programs. If you're not already following us on social media, on social media please do so. That's the best place to hear about upcoming events. Um, you can also sign up for our newsletter on our website. There you can also join special cohorts of peers interested in topics like sports, literacy, or youth employment. You can also find out more about consultation support and technical assistance for your summer program. So once again, thank you everybody for joining us today. I hope that you found the webinar informative and we'll be sending a link to the recording and the slides, we'll be emailing that to you. Uh, thank you again and have a great day.